Cross it. Hey everybody, Dr. O here. I wanted to kind of update everyone on where we're at with the coronavirus, now known as COVID-19, since the last time we talked about it in class. I also receive a lot of questions via email, text, social media, so I wanted to sprinkle in some of the more frequently asked questions that I've seen and see if I can offer some insight. Uh, I'm not your medical doctor. This is not medical advice. These are just people asking me for my opinions, and I'm going to share it here. Um, I mainly want to talk about, so it's going to be a little bit, a little bit long here, but I mainly want to talk about social distancing, why it works, why it's important, etc. We'll talk about the virus, we'll talk about some of its relatives, we'll talk about uh, where viruses like this come from, will it happen again, all these types of things. So let's go ahead and dive in. So when we first started talking about this new virus in class, it was only a problem in, in Wuhan, and clearly uh, that has changed. We'll talk about maybe how we missed some things there in the beginning, but here's the most uh, recent information that I've seen over a quarter million confirmed cases and over 10,000 dead. So let's let's dive in. So why did this take us by surprise? Right. So when we first talked about it in class, I said, you know, let's let's not be concerned about it at this point. Knowing what we knew then, I think that was still very fair, but things have changed. First of all, every new infection takes us by surprise, right? We, we can't know when or where they're going to strike. But what was so unique about this virus that allowed it to grow out of control? Part of it was our human error, right? A lack, a lack of testing. Where there, had, there, had, there wasn't enough testing in the beginning. There hasn't been enough testing now. We don't even know the actual scope of what's going on with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the COVID-19 disease. So we thought, right, it was just another SARS, and SARS was terrible, but SARS was something that was able to be contained, and for multiple reasons, that hasn't been the case here. So that's one of the biggest reasons why this was surprising to see how it kind of grew out of control. One of the biggest differences, and we'll talk about this more later, is that this virus is easily spread by asymptomatic people. Its closest relatives, SARS and MERS, are primarily spread by sick people. And it's so much easier to contain a disease if you know who has it and who can spread it and you can quarantine them and contain them. Not the case when the huge majority of infections are mild and then you have people that are asymptomatic that are still possibly spreading the disease. This virus, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, also lives on surfaces longer than its close relatives that we'll talk about more. Its aerosol droplets stay in the air longer. So you're looking at a virus. We, we assumed it was a virus that uh, didn't live on surfaces very long, didn't stay in the air very long, and we knew who was capable of spreading it. But now we know that asymptomatic carriers can be spreading it. People are spreading it before they're showing any symptoms. It can stay in the air in these aeros small aerosol droplets for maybe three hours, and it can survive on surfaces longer than its close relatives. So for all of these reasons, this thing is just transmitting itself around the globe in a way in a way that its, its cousins SARS and MERS never did, never could. So let's talk about social distancing. The idea that um, keeping away from other people is is one of the best ways to flatten the curve, as you can see here. Now, when I think about this personally, so I've been I've been in the house all week. Uh, so it's been five days since since I left the house. My wife has to go to the hospital uh, and work, but uh, me and the children have been home and we're doing our best to, to, to flatten the curve with social distancing. But I don't think it, it's not for me, right? It's, it's certainly been uncomfortable and a nuisance for me and I'm moving all my classes online. So it's been a lot of work and it, it isn't something that I'm really enjoying. But when I look at it, I realize it isn't about me. So I, I'm not super concerned about me. Doesn't I mean I could certainly get sick. I could certainly get very sick, but I'm not. I'm not concerned about me. Um, I'm not even super concerned about Oliver, right? And and my children because uh, uh, well, for reasons we'll talk about later, with really no no one under the age of nine uh, or nine or under um, dying at this point. When I think of social distancing and what we're doing as a family is we're trying to protect the elderly. We're trying to protect my in-laws that watch Oliver when, I, when I'm at work. We're trying to protect immunocompromised people. And, and I think really, really important thing is we're trying to protect the entire healthcare system. So we'll come back and talk about that later. So when people, when people talk about how this is a nuisance and it's disrupting their lives and we're, this is, uh, uh, we're blowing this out of proportion, you have to realize that you can't think about you. I'm healthy. My kids are healthy. I'm not worried about this. What we're trying to do is we're all trying to stop the spread of this virus that maybe you would be fine, but your neighbors wouldn't be, or uh, your child's kindergarten teacher wouldn't be, et cetera, et cetera. So this really is, we're, we're all doing this for the greater good. That's, I think that's a very important point to make.
Um, here's a really good example. If you go read this article, I strongly recommend it. They, they do a comparison of Philadelphia and St. Louis during the Spanish flu outbreak of in 1918 that killed 600,000 Americans, potentially 50 million people around the globe. This is just a great, great example. You see this chart here in Philadelphia. They had a parade, and 200,000 people came to this parade. And at the same time, in St. Louis, they were closing churches and closing theaters and, and doing what they could do to distance themselves from each other, closing schools. And you'll see what happened here. After this parade, where 200,000 people clustered together, every single bed in all 31 hospitals in Philadelphia were full, and thousands of people died because they clustered together. So if you're, one, if you're complaining about the fact that they've canceled the NBA and the NCAA tournament, just think about if this type of thing were to happen again. So St. Louis really was spared the worst of the Spanish flu in 1918 because of social distancing. So there's just an example of where it has worked in the past. Uh, and again, it, it, maybe it isn't about you. Maybe, that, maybe this is more of a nuisance to me than a protective thing for me, but this is what I'm primarily thinking about. I mean, my, my wife, my stepdaughter, they're, they're part of the healthcare system, my students. But the primary, the primary reason to social distance at this point and flatten this curve, in my opinion, besides saving individual lives, is to make sure that our healthcare system doesn't get too overburdened. The mortality rate of this disease is quite a bit lower if you live in an area where your healthcare system can handle the load of new patients that we're looking at. Uh, so this, the, here's some information here. Uh, in the U.S., there's about 2.8 hospital beds per 1,000 people. Very, very low. So there's, uh, and like it says, they're at the bottom at any given time. About 68% of, of our million hospital beds are full. So we have 300,000 hospital beds available. And who cares if that number a little bit higher, a little lower, doesn't matter. Uh, another way to look at it, there are 95,000 intensive care unit beds in the United States. There are 160,000 ventilators. So how many patients can we have that are seriously ill before we're out of beds? We're, we're obviously already running out of PPEs. We're, we're out of beds. We're out of ventilators. This is already happening in New York. They're sharing ventilators between, between more than one patient. So another way to look at it is even if you don't have older in-laws or older parent, parents to care about, we have to keep the healthcare system from being overburdened because if, if we're running out, if our healthcare workers are all getting sick and we're running out of equipment and running out of beds and we can't care for people, then more people will die. So you staying home, you distancing yourself from other people could potentially be saving someone's life, even if all you're doing is keeping our healthcare system from being, from being too burdened. All right, um, is there a downside? I'm definitely, I think social distancing is what we need to be doing, just so you know, but I want to talk about one potential downside. We do need to reach herd immunity. For, for, this, for this disease, for this virus to become just an endemic thing that only causes small problems or maybe to go away, we have to reach herd immunity, which means we have to reach a point where the huge majority, 70% or more people, are immune. And the, the, the best way to do that, please hear me out, the best way to do that is to let this disease just run through our country and kill who it's going to kill, expose everybody, and whoever's left standing is now immune, and now we have herd immunity. That's the best way if you're trying to reach herd immunity the fastest. But if you're trying to keep people safe and keep people from dying, then social distancing is a better idea. And we, let, and we let this disease slowly trickle through the population so we don't burden our healthcare system too much and less people die. But the reality is it will take longer. So the downside to what we're doing right now and flattening this curve is that maybe this will take three years before we can reach some level of herd immunity. But that's a phenomenal trade-off. I'm just trying to explain the biological downside to what we're doing, but I don't, th I don't think it's a bad idea in any way, shape, or form. Our this is a very common question I see. Our coronavirus is new. So the reality, the reality is no, not even close. Um, I always like to say that um, you've probably not had the coronavirus, right? SARS-CoV-2 that we're talking about, but you've definitely had a coronavirus. And that's because there are four coronaviruses that cause the, ca cause the common cold. They actually cause 20 to 30% of all the common colds. So if, you, if you're more than a few years old, statistically speaking, you've had a coronavirus infection, but, but not 
SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus we're talking about now. So they are not new. They've been with humans a very long time. And then over the last couple of decades, we've seen some new variants of coronaviruses show up. So this is actually the seventh coronavirus. We have the four that caused the common cold. Then let me show you this here. We have SARS and MERS. So SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. That'd be the SARS virus. And then MERS is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. So SARS and MERS are closely related to this COVID-19 that we're dealing with now. Uh, and then you see this a comparison here with the flu. So the R naught or R sub zero you see there is how in, in, in normal situations, how many people are going to get infected by every sick person? So one thing you can see here is that COVID-19 does have a higher R naught or R sub zero than the flu, but it's actually lower than SARS. And then MERS was quite a bit lower there. The case fatality rate, the mortality rate, we're looking at somewhere between 0.25 and 4%. We don't know at this point with COVID-19. Notice that SARS and MERS are both higher. But let's go ahead and look at those. So MERS has by far the highest fatality rate of these three coronaviruses. But you pretty much only got it if you were elderly or had some sort of comorbidity. Comorbid Healthy people didn't get it. So it was, it was really hard to get, but if you got it, there was a very high likelihood you were going to die. SARS was relatively easy to get, but it was primarily healthcare workers that took the brunt of it because they knew when it was spread. It was spread when people were very, very sick. So that number is pretty high, but it was only happening when people were sick. So other than healthcare workers, it wasn't, it wasn't running through populations the same way that COVID-19 is. COVID-19 has a lower r naught, but for this, the incubation period of 4 to 14 days where people are asymptomatic or have very mild illness, they could still be spreading the disease. So I think that's what makes this um, an especially dangerous organism if you're looking at infectability, right, or how or how, uh, how quickly it's traveling around the globe. The other thing to note here is that, especially comparing it to the flu, it isn't just a bad flu. The flu certainly kills people. The flu has killed more Americans than by far than COVID-19 has. But look at the hospitalization rate. About 20% of people end up in the hospital, 15 to 20%, somewhere in that ballpark, whereas with the flu, it, that's a much, much lower number. So, not, so lots of people are going to be hospitalized. Thankfully, only a small percentage of them are going to die, but it's still worth noting. All right, uh, so, that, so this is not new. Just you know, th this, this is a new or novel version of the coronavirus, but coronaviruses are not new. So why is SARS-CoV-2 so infectious? I, I picked this this article here from from the journal Science to talk about because the main issue that that I that, that I see is that people are spreading it when they don't know they're sick or else they have a very mild illness. Eighty one to eighty four percent of people that actually have SARS CoV two infection are either asymptomatic or had have very mild condition. So for a few days, maybe you've had a little bit of a cough, you just don't feel great, you think it's just a cold, but you're out, you're out there spreading it. So the biggest number here from this article was that undocumented or unknown infections were the cause or source of 79% of the documented cases. So most of the people getting this disease are getting it from people that either didn't know they had it or had such a mild illness that they, that they weren't concerned about it, but they were still out and they were still spreading it. With SARS, if you were sick, you were quarantined, you were, you were taken out of the population, you were contained, and you weren't spreading it to other people, except for healthcare workers, sadly. In this condition, people are going to work, they're going to school, they have no idea that they're carrying this, this, this very, very dangerous virus because for them, it's a mild illness or they're asymptomatic. So to me, that is the number one reason. And when people ask me about why this is so much more infectious than we thought. It's the reality that you could easily be spreading this disease before you know you're sick. All right, uh, another question that we hear obviously a ton is, is COVID-19 really that bad? Like, I'm not worried about it. It's not going to kill me, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the, the three key factors that I look at here is age, so clearly, the old, as you can see here, uh, this is with the comorbidities, but the older you are, the more likely you are to die. So no one, no one nine or under has died, and, you, and I'll show you some age-related stuff in just a little bit. But a, as your age goes up, your risk of dying goes way up. So age is a very big factor. Number two we have here are comorbidities or pre-existing medical conditions. So cardiovascular disease, diabetes, lung disease, high blood pressure. These are all going to things that are going to make, make this organism that much more dangerous. Uh, and the third one is where you live is your healthcare system overwhelmed. So here I'm in South Dakota. At this point, there are 14 cases. Uh, any, anyone that's, that's infected there or that has a documented case is being well taken care of. 
in other parts of the world and other parts of the United States. The healthcare system is so stressed that is there a bed for you? Can they actually take care of you? Can they, um, do they have a ventilator for you? These types of things. So I think those are the three key factors. When you ask me, is it, is it really that bad? I would say for you as an individual, how old are you? Do you have these comorbidities or pre-existing conditions? And it, how stressed is the healthcare system in your area? I mean, I've heard just the things that are happening in New York are alone already uh, make me very, very thankful that I live somewhere where we don't, we're not seeing that at this point. I've also been specifically asked about pregnancy. Again, I, you know, I, I don't think we know the answers. I haven't seen any evidence that... Um, that uh, being pregnant increases your risk at all, or even that this virus increases your risk for preterm birth, but I have to assume it does because the flu virus and other things do. So uh, I, can't, I can't point to any evidence that pregnancy is something that makes this worse, but I'd have to believe so. Again, just my personal opinion. I haven't seen the evidence to, to support that or refute it. Why should I worry? I'm young and I'm healthy. This is another thing that's that is surprising people. So as you can see here, CDC data shows that nearly 40% of hospitalizations are people aged 20 to 54. Now they're not going to die. They're, 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 they're going to be hospitalized. They're going to fill up, you know, they're going to disrupt the healthcare system. They're going to fill up all these hospital beds. They're, they're going to survive. They're going to be very, very ill. So if you're young and healthy, if you're a young 30-year-old, you still got a really good shot if you get this disease that you end up hospitalized. And, and you probably will survive. But will the person next to you, because they're running out of resources, taking care of you? That's why, that's why I keep going back to the same thing. We're, we are all doing our part to protect everyone by not getting this disease, even if you think you're young and healthy and you can handle it. What is the actual mortality rate of COVID-19? This is something we talked about a lot in class a few weeks ago. As you can see here, they're estimating huge ranges because we don't know the answers yet. You only know this when you look back and you do blood analysis and all sorts of testing and looking backwards to figure out how many people actually had the disease. But I want to talk about why, why you don't know because I already showed you a chart. Here's how many confirmed cases. Here's how many deaths. Don't we know the case fatality rate or mortality rate? No. Um, the range that they give here is between 0.25 and 3%. It's a huge range, and they're even, they're even saying that it's probably going to be on the lower end. So even though if you run the math, I ran the math today, the numbers I showed you earlier in this, in this presentation would have put the mortality rate at 4%. About 4% of people that are confirmed cases died. But the number is going to be lower than that mainly because you have a disease that while it can be fatal and causes hospitalizations in 15 to 20 percent of cases, 80 percent of people have mild illness. So how many of those people never got diagnosed, never went in, they just thought they had the cold, they had a mild enough illness where they just wanted to stay home, so they're not in the system. So if you look at the, the numerator, which is the number of people that have died. We know how many people have died, or at least a really close number, divided by the, 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 you know, the, the denominator, which would be the total number of cases. The total number of cases is probably much, much bigger. Like here in South Dakota, there's a backlog. They're out, they're out of tests. There's uh, only 14 positive cases, but there's like 270 that are pending, and we have no idea how many, actual, how many more are out there, and that's just here in South Dakota. It's much worse than, worse than other, other places. So I think if you ask me where it's going to end up, I, I say it's going to end up at one or even under one is, is where I think it'll end up. But that's just kind of my gut feeling based on the fact that there's probably been a lot, lot, lot more people infected than we actually knew. All right. So why are children safe? So the reason I put safe in quotation marks up there is because they still get the disease. And it's, but it's unknown why they're not dying. So you see the numbers here, no fatalities, nine and under, 0.2% for 10 to 19 years old. And that's awesome, right? This is the biggest silver lining. Like if this, if this disease was killing kids, I would be terrified. Anyone that knows me know how much, knows how much I care about Oliver and my stepchildren and, and how terrified I would be. Uh, and I cannot be objective when it comes to my own son. So I, I this is really the, the biggest silver lining and the biggest, the biggest good news so far with this disease. But as far as why, I cannot really give you an answer. I've researched and researched this. Um, they just don't understand it. So they get it, but they're not dying. I think the two biggest, the, the two best hypotheses I've seen so far is one is that maybe their young immune systems aren't developed enough or at the point where they can develop what are called immunopathologies. So where your own, your own immune system creates these cytokine storms that could be doing a lot of the damage. 
That is potentially one reason. The other thing that I've seen is that maybe their lungs are not the kind of environment. Usually these coronaviruses like SARS and, and SARS-CoV-2 here, they hit you once and then you start to feel better and then they hit you a second time and that's, and that's when they kill you. Um, potentially the, the, these young lungs are just not the environment where that second wave comes through. Those would be my, my two best guesses as to why children are not, not dying, but you know, thank God they're not. All right. Is it a good thing that 80% or more of infections are mild or asymptomatic? It is great for them, right? If I'm going to get it, I want to be mild or asymptomatic, but it's bad for controlling the spread. To other people for all the reasons we've said before. The, the majority of the cases are people getting it from other people that don't even know they have it because they, they have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. So it's very hard to flatten that curve we keep talking about if people don't know they're sick. It was much easier to control SARS because people, people had to be sick to be spreading the disease. We know with, with SARS-CoV-2 here, COVID-19, that um, they don't have to be. So, so it's it, again, I'm hitting, hitting this from all angles here just to give you a complete picture. This is great news for those individuals, but very bad news for spreading the disease, right? The last time we went to the store to get some more food, um, no, one was, no, one, no one was coughing, no one was visibly ill, but we have no idea who, what was being spread and by whom because so many people don't have symptoms or have very mild symptoms. All right, um, is SARS-CoV-2 -CoV hard to kill? So I put kill in parentheses there because, uh, or that's quotation marks, sorry. It's a good thing I teach biology. Because you can't kill a virus. They're not alive, right? We inactivate viruses. People, people use the word kill. I, don't, I could care less. But, but they're not, right? They, they're envelope viruses. So another, another piece of good news here is these viruses are very fragile. The envelope viruses are the weakest of, of the viruses. They're the easiest to kill or inactivate. Um, alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, your quaternary ammonium compounds we talk about in class. Soap. Soap can disrupt this lipid envelope and, and, and destroy these viruses. So they are not hard to kill. The key is to get them killed, get them inactivated while they're on surfaces or while they're on your hands before they get in you. Because once they get in you, that's where they're going to cause a problem. So I just showed some alcohol here, but, but really uh, there's a long list of things that, that will kill slash inactivate SARS-CoV-2. That is, that is not the biggest concern. I think personally, soap Soap, soap will do just a fine job because soap will disrupt the lipid membrane in that lipid envelope. So no, not the answer here is no. Uh, I've seen this question a few times. Is using disinfectants making SARS-CoV-2 worse? Uh, when you look, think about resistance, right? So using chemicals and things becoming resistant. I'm usually more concerned about this with bacteria than I am viruses. Uh, with, with viruses, it's absolutely true that they can develop resistance, especially to antiviral drugs. HIV is a great example. One of the reasons that we use combinations of drugs is because if you throw any one drug at a virus like HIV, it will mutate around it. But that's going to be more on the treatment end. As far as um, using hydrogen peroxide, using alcohol, is that is that leading to resistance? I, I don't think that's a big enough deal to be concerned right now. You should be washing your hands and disinfecting way more than you think at this point because we're trying to flatten this curve. Let's worry about, let's worry about that down the line. But I'm certainly not saying that what we do isn't leading to resistance, but I just don't think this is something we should be too concerned about now. As long as, unless this virus, virus were to mutate to where it no longer had a lipid envelope, anything that disrupts those lipids should still do a very, very good job of inactivating this, this virus. Do face masks help? I, I, I question whether to even talk about this or not, because, um, there's conflicting information, and also I think there's a reason why the message is that, that we, we shouldn't be using them. But, you know, I've, I do it here. The average person touches their face about 23 times an hour. So one of the main benefits of wearing a face mask, if you were to wear one, and it's fitted and you wear it properly, is to, for it to keep, touching, keep you from touching your face. Uh, but if you're wearing one that's improperly fitted and you're fiddling with it all the time or you're constantly popping it off to eat or drink or do different things, you might be touching your face more. So in that case, you definitely wouldn't want to be using a face mask. So who should use one? I think that if you're sick, the evidence is clear that if you're sick, wearing one is a really, really good idea. And then healthcare workers that are going to be knee deep in this need them as well. So I, I'm glad the messaging has been not to wear them, that we, you don't need to wear them. But I'm, I cannot say that they, they wouldn't protect you. If they were properly fitted and you were using them correctly, um, I definitely can't say that they, that they wouldn't help you to some extent. But we can't steal them from the people that, that need them. So if we're taking so many of them and hoarding them and people that are perfectly healthy are wearing them when they're walking down the street, 
and then a healthcare worker doesn't have one or someone that's sick doesn't have one, that's a huge problem. So that's why I'm glad the messaging has been don't worry about face masks, but at the same time, I can't say that, they, that they're not doing you any good, just so you know. All right, um, can you catch it twice? Seen this multiple times as well. I know there was a, there was a case where they thought that happened. Um, at this point, I, I would say no. I don't know if there was a testing issue or what there was with that case, but to catch it that quickly a second time, I, d I don't think so. Now, is this mutating? Yeah, I mean, viruses mutate. Uh, this shouldn't mutate uh, in, the, in the same ways that like the flu virus does, where it mixes and matches genes, but it's mutating and changing along the way. Could it reach the point where it mutates enough where it becomes something else? Uh, yeah, absolutely, I, I, absolutely. But the main thing I wanted to talk about here, so I don't think that you're gonna get it now and get it again in 14 days. But one thing I find pretty interesting, the research done on SARS and MERS has shown that immunity doesn't last very long. So this might be the kind of thing where even if you got it and you were immune seven months, eight months, a year, year and a half down the line, I can't guarantee you still will be. And it doesn't nothing to do with mutation. It's just the, the immunity from fighting off this infection doesn't seem to last. And I can't say that for this virus for sure. We're just looking at the best evidence we have from those relatives, SARS and MERS. This also might be a problem with vaccines, though. If you, if you create a vaccine, will we have the same issue where the immunity just doesn't last very long? Don't know. But as for now, if you were to ask me personally, Personally, again, not medical, uh, not medical advice. If you were asking if you can catch it twice, I would say no. What's next for this virus, SARS-CoV-2? Uh, it could disappear, like SARS basically has. It could become a more mild endemic disease. A lot of times that happens when a new virus shows up. It causes a real, real big problem, and then it settles in and maybe infects our nasal passages, and it just becomes this, this, this mild endemic thing that's constantly with us, possibly. It could disappear and then pop up occasionally, maybe after every generation or so, when the, the last generation that was immune has moved on past adulthood, maybe it'll kind of pop back in like that, potentially potentially, or it could get worse because of some mutations that make it worse. So honestly, I have no idea, but it's going to constantly be changing and mutating, and these are all potential things that could happen. Good question, though. Will something like this happen again? The answer is absolutely yes. As you can see, this, I put this bat here because uh, uh, the, the bat coronavirus that's believed is what create, created this uh, SARS-CoV-2 bat coronavirus. And it's not just bats, but um, the reality is that according to the World Health Organization, over 60% of all human diseases are zoonotic or zoonotic, which means they used to be animal diseases that jumped into humans. And 75% of all new diseases that have been discovered in the last decade are these zoonotic or zoonotic diseases. So as long as we live near animals that, ha that have uh, viruses, bacteria, etc., as long as we continue to encroach on their habitats and, and spread our reach on this planet, we have no idea we're going to come into contact with. We have, we have no idea what the, what the next bat in the rainforest is carrying or the next animal here, next animal there. We have no idea what's going to happen when we eat exotic animals or we go to places where humans aren't normally at. So this is the, the if you want to live in close proximity with animals and you want to consume them and you want to continue to spread our reach on this planet, we are going to bump into organisms we've never seen before. And some of them are going to take a liking to human beings and, and that's what's going to happen. So that so that do not think this is the last time that we'll ever have this this spillover event where an animal or uh, an animal virus finds its way into human beings. It will definitely happen again. Uh, why are they worse? Why are new diseases worse? Well, think about it. No one's immune to it. There's certainly no herd immunity protecting us as a group. There's no immunity at all. So when a new virus or a new new organism jumps into humans, it has just a heyday uh, because of that, because there, there is no protection. We also didn't know about it, so there's no vaccines, no drugs, etc., which is what we're seeing now. Uh, then over time, so let's say this virus decides to stick, or stick, or stick around, um, it should evolve towards mildness. So over time, I think that the, you know these organisms, they kind of find a happy medium where they can infect us and they can occasionally cause problems, but we've, we constantly give them a home, give them an environment, a way to pass on their genetic material. Killing, wiping us out isn't good for them either. So, oh, so this is generally what happens. The, when a disease first jumps into the human population, it's nasty, and then it should become more mild as we move forward. That's, that's again, my best guess. We will have to wait and look back from the future and find out. When will there be a vaccine? Now, people talk about a vaccine a lot. I know there's been some, there, the trials are already starting and that's great. But if there was a vaccine, I mean, let's do it this way. There's still not a vaccine for SARS. And that was from 2002, 2003. If there's a vaccine, 
to 18 months to two years is like a would be like a wet record pace. So hopefully they can do it and hopefully we have it. But um, if you want to actually fully test a vaccine, it's going to take a ton of money and a ton of time. So don't expect a vaccine to save us here in the next few weeks. That's just, that's just not reality. Why don't treatments exist already? Well, specifically, this virus is brand new, but um, we, it has relatives, right? So if, if we continue to do research on SARS and MERS and we made some good um, progress in those areas, then potentially we'd have something to work with. But funding in those areas dried up. I mean, so you think about it, SARS basically disappeared. There's no money in it. So the research that was being done to combat SARS and look for vaccines and look for treatments, the funding dried up because uh, pharmaceutical companies have to make money and there just wasn't any money in the, in the area. So we need more research funding and we have to continue to do research funding. I think it's clear after this one that coronaviruses are gonna continue to be a problem. So I hope that research funding towards studying coronaviruses and looking for the next new one will, will, will continue to go and we won't forget about this, right? It's kind of like, um, I heard someone say the other day that because uh, lot, obviously lots of people are, aren't very happy with vaccination, but this is something we're talking about all the time. So someone was asked if there was a, a SARS-CoV or COVID-19 vaccine, would people take it? And they said this year they would, next year they wouldn't, right? We can't, we cannot afford to forget about this and what's going on right now and the disrupt, the cost in human lives and the disruption in our lives. We have to remember that. Um, as far as the treatments, they're, they're studying all, oh, there's dozens and dozens of studies being done looking for treatments. They're looking at potentially some um, anti-flu medications, uh, anti-Ebola medications might be working, lots of cool things happening. Uh, maybe you uh, had somebody asked me a question about convalescent serum. So the idea that um, uh, antibodies from someone that's recovered could help someone, certainly that's, that's used in, in many diseases, including Ebola. Convalescent serum is an option, but... Um, it basically takes one person to save one person. So as far as ramping that up, it would have to be some sort of an antibody therapy, and, and they're working on those. So I certainly hope that there's, there's, there's treatments coming in the very, very near future. Was SARS-CoV-2 made in a lab? This is, so I've, uh, this is one of the questions I've, I've been asked the most. There is no evidence to support that. If you actually look at the, uh, the evolution of this virus, it certainly doesn't look like anything that, that a human made. I, I always like to say that Mother Nature did not need our help to make this virus. So I, I see no evidence to support that. Just have a little fun before we quit here. What are the best toilet paper alternatives? I have no idea, but the, uh, the, the toilet paper thing, I have students telling me that all the yeast is gone from their stores. Could we use least yeast for one of our labs? Like clearly this is this is something that is big. My wife's been calling it a panic demic and, uh, and, and hoarding all the toilet paper is part of it. So I, I actually don't know where we use wipes in, in my house, but uh, I just wanted to kind of uh, leave you with a little bit of a smile, hopefully. So from a teaching standpoint, what should we learn from this experiment experience? Well, one thing, one of the biggest things I've been telling students is um, everything we're doing now, we should be doing anyways to protect ourselves from the flu, right? So we're, we're actually already doing what we should. If you look at, uh, I mean, were people not washing their hands before? Were, not people, were people not doing these kinds of things? So we're doing what we should do every flu season is something that, that I'd like to, to keep in mind. Number two, we have to invest in research. If you have money, share it. We, we, we have to invest in more research before this happens again. Um, and I've already mentioned, right, as long as, as humans are going to be consuming exotic animals and they're going to be um, moving into new habitats, the, the reality that these kind of things are going to happen is, is there. So keep that in mind. And then lastly, just this idea of the globalization of disease, right? This was, this was a problem over there, wherever over there is, right? We don't care about diseases that, that are over there, but there's no such thing as over there anymore. Now you actually have people that are bringing this virus back to China because of travel. So, so globalization means that we all have to be concerned about all these diseases, especially ones that are contagious like this. Okay, so those are just my thoughts, and I think I've answered all the major questions that students or anybody else has asked me. So just, you know, not medical advice, just my personal opinion. I hope this brings you up to speed, and uh, we can get out of our homes pretty soon because we've, uh, we've dealt with this thing, we've conquered it. And so, all right, I hope this helps. You have a wonderful day. Be blessed.